The His Girl Friday podcast is brought to you in part by Messenger Fellowship, living the kingdom, fulfilling the call, proclaiming the truth. How's it going, guys? This is Cameron with His Girl Friday. Hope you're doing well, that you're staying healthy, staying alive, staying fresh, and in good spirits as we continue to venture on in this epic saga known as 2020. I want to keep today's pod short and sweet as much as possible and just focus on the content at hand. There will be time for life updates and something maybe more impromptu in nature, but um, I just wanted to kind of reel you into my latest post. What I've been doing during quarantine, or one of the things anyway, is going back through old blogs written between 2010 and 2015, 2016, back when my writing wasn't as sharp, as good as it is today. I had some great ideas and some premises, and you know, if I was writing something like an outline for a legacy youth sermon, I did well, uh, but some of the writing, I'm just like, mm, I just need to go back and remaster this post. I need to put new language in it or just rework it all together. And this was one of those posts. It's called The Road Less Traveled By. I wrote it uh, February 15, 2014, or at least published that day. So over six years old. I really liked uh, that post. I remember talking about it with my youth. It was during a time when I was teaching them how to study the Word. We had implemented a new Bible study process called SOAP, where you have a scripture, you share observations, then go to application, then you pray it in, see the scripture, see the prayer. You're marrying Bible reading and studying with and meditation with prayer. It was great. Um, and this is all centered on John 4. So if you want to turn there in your Bibles or, you know, get your Bible apps and queue it up to John 4. One of the principles I was trying to teach the youth at this time was how important it is to derive context in reading the Word. If I say John 4, you don't start at John 4, 1. You need to go back and check John 3 to see if there's any important context uh, that would be necessary in uh, kind of gathering your observations together. And lo and behold, I think John 4 is one of the best passages in the entire scriptures when it comes to needing to go back a chapter to really embrace the full story of the current one, John 4 in this case. So, uh, all right, so let's just jump in. Back when I was a young buck, a young Padawan, studying the word, kind of had this bad habit of downplaying settings, like geography, time, historical backdrops, cultural implications, stuff like that. I figured by skimming the peripherals, I'd get to the meat the heart of the passage more quickly without distraction. Kind of took the spirit of spark notes and applied it to my Bible reading. It's like, I just want to know what th- this verse is. Like almost, I don't want to say get in and get out, but just I didn't want to get lost in rabbit trails and kind of forget, okay, why am I here? What is this passage saying? Just kind of get to the heart, grab it and go. However, as I now know in my early 30s, when we consider the scriptures, the ministry of the scriptures even, we find every word, pronoun, and article carrying strategic purpose and placement, which ties us back to John 4, where we find Jesus not just ministering to a woman at a well, but resurrecting an entire community and literally going the extra yard in finding them. The power of one is going to be a very important theme as we proceed the next 10, 15 minutes. But before this encounter even takes place, the woman at the well, that is, we're given important context retroactive to John 3, 22 through 23. So I'm going to read that real quick. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing Anon near Salim because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized. This in mind, let's flash forward to John 4, 1 through 5. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. All right, so between John 3 and John 4, we're given three regions as backstory to John 4. Three regions of backstory, uh, Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. With Galilee and Samaria, we're given specifics But Judea, the starting point, the reference is less clear, a little more ambiguous. Still, corporately, we have enough detail to discern the relationship between these three areas, these three communities. 
If you're on my blog, you'll note an animated graphic showing where Jesus started and where he was going. He was almost going due north. Uh, Jerusalem was, if you, let's just say he started in Jerusalem for sake of argument. That's maybe 30, 40 miles south of Sakaar, and then you have Nazareth and Galilee. Another 50, 60, I'm guesstimating based on uh, some pinpoints I nailed down earlier. I don't take these amounts as gospel truth. Um, these are just estimates here, but clearly the road for Jesus in John 4 led through Sakaar, and there were some cultural tensions between the Samaritans and the Jews at this time. Many wouldn't go through Sakaar or travel through Samaritan towns. They would go the scenic route. They would travel all the way east of the Jordan to avoid them if they could at all possible, and they would add a couple marathons in terms of miles to their journeys. It's pretty crazy, pretty remarkable when you think about the magnitude of hate between the Jews and Samaritans. But we're going to come back, kind of push hold on that for now. Let's go back to verse 2. Jesus is leaving Judea for Galilee from a somewhat debatable departure point, because again, that starting point in Judea is a little less clear, but we could assume that he's starting to where, or near John was, he was starting where John was baptizing, or close to that proximity. So we could deduce the car not only as a sensible midpoint, but a contrast to how Jews traveled, given the cultural climate between them. Still, we must ask the question, it's fair to wonder, why did Jesus go to Sakaar in the first place? Was there more to it than just convenience? Yes, absolutely. We still need to examine two more ingredients, though, to really understand why Sakaar made maximal sense. Number one, relational dynamics. We kind of alluded to that earlier, just the cultural tension between the Samaritans and the Jews. And the timeline. This gets into the settings aspect that I was alluding to earlier. The timeline is very critical here, as John makes some interesting observations. We'll start with the relational dynamics won't camp out here long because we've already kind of teased it a little bit. Back in Jesus' time, it was culturally unacceptable for a Jew to enter a Samaritan town. And we kind of see that in the Good Samaritan parables. A lot of us know that, even if we aren't believers, we're aware of the Good Samaritan tale. Samaritans were widely considered half-breeds, half-Gentile, half-Jew. If a Jew was departing Jerusalem on route to Galilee, he would have had to travel a considerable distance just to avert Samaria altogether. But to them, it was worth it. But that's not how Jesus worked. Throughout his ministry, throughout his life, he always took the road less traveled by. And in this case, he took it for two reasons. Number one, to shatter the mold of social norms through his methods of unity, using the one, the one woman at the well. And in doing that, number two, to share the good news and preview the spirit as part of an emerging worship culture. This is a big one. I don't want to underestimate it by, you know, not giving it its due time, but... I did put in the post, you know, I'm going to come back to this. Because a lot of times Jesus is going from place to place sharing the good news about who he is, what he's come to do. He's been sent from the Father. Salvation is at hand. Repent. But he's also previewing that radical middle. And by that I mean, soon you will worship in spirit and in truth. Or truth and in spirit, because the spirit really wasn't on their radar in their lexicon yet. So it's kind of interesting to note that the preview of the Spirit is such a central theme throughout John 4. you got the power of one, and you got the preview of the Holy Spirit to come. Timeline. Let's talk about the timeline real quick. We must consider the timing of this passage as verse 6 indicates. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Okay, so why would John emphasize a topical detail like the six hour? To me, that just stands out. I'm reading that, okay, six hour, why is that worth putting in there? If you're like me, it's, you know, you've found over the years, when you have a question mark go off like that, drill down on it. Dare to investigate and implore what the author was thinking, including that detail. At first glance, you see 6 hour, and you're like, oh, 6 a.m., 6 p.m.? Well, not according to the Jewish clock. The 6th hour would have, in fact, been noon, midday, 12 p.m., take your pick. So like the location, the ramifications of this observation is significant and why the soap Bible study has merit. This is a critical observation. If Jesus arrived at noon, then he would have appeared during peak heat, a time when many were indoors escaping the scorching sun. 
That's why well activity generally peaked during the dawn hours and I suppose the dusk hours, but certainly the dawn hours as people are getting ready for the day, they wanna have their water supply in stock, they don't wanna to have to go back out and just get fried, right? You know, so Jesus, he knows he's gonna be tired and he's just, um, he knows that he's gonna arrive around, if he leaves Judea in the morning, he's probably gonna arrive around midday based on the amount of miles and the amount of, you know, the rate that he's walking at. So it's again, fair to ask and worth wondering, did Jesus arrive at random? Or did he time his journey to Sakar? And as mentioned, yes, I believe Jesus did time it. He had every intention of meeting the woman exactly when he did, because he loved this woman, but he also loved the town she was going to witness to eventually. And it wasn't that Jesus was afraid of what man thought, but he certainly didn't want to make a scene. He didn't want to cause chaos or commotion and distract the woman from receiving this important message he had for her. So he chose a time when this woman would come out. She was an outcast low men on the totem pole. And the Samaritans as a group were low men on the totem pole for that region. So I'm talking about the low of the low. And Jesus went after her, this one woman at the well. Such a powerful story, metaphor, analogy, illustration. I mean, this John 4 is loaded. So yes, Jesus, I believe he did intentionally arrive at Zakar at noon so that he could have this uninterrupted one-on-one -on -one time with the woman, knowing that no one else would be out there or at least from a distance. All right, so we're trying to find the why here still, because that's the short answer. Jesus did time his trip, but the longer answer integrates why Jesus came to inspire this particular woman at this particular time in light of her tumultuous history. See verses 16 through 19. Based on these verses, I'd say the why is as follows. Jesus came to change a woman's life through the revelation of his divinity so she could inspire a town through the revelation of his compassion. And I've put in a uh, spoken word video. It's over a decade old, but it's one of my favorite spoken words. In fact, it's the one spoken word that really whet my appetite and just inspired me to create my own throughout my legacy of 10 years. So it's called The Woman at the Well. I don't think I think it's a copy. It's not the original. Anyway, as the spoken word attests, as you will watch and see for yourself, Christ so loved this woman at the well. He couldn't help but transform her from an ostracized outcast into a victorious vessel where his evangelism, his message of love, would snowball into a cultural revolution. Once an adulteress, now a mouthpiece with testimony and a, ma and a message to share. I mean, if that's not the kingdom in motion, I don't know what is. And that's why I find John 4 so captivating. When we consider Christ's intentionality, talk about his ministry of reconciliation, you can't separate it from the ministry of intentionality. His strategy to free this woman from bondage and ignite her hope through his identity. I mean, how can we not get excited? Like Jesus, we should want to restore life amidst the broken hearts and dreams we encounter on a daily basis. Or at least weekly basis. We should want to ignite change in those who doubt their worth. But, above all of that, we should want to accept the call to lead others to a greater standing of who God is. Those other points, they're subsets of the main one. Are we pointing people in the direction of Jesus? Are we being Jesus in their face, in the moment, the light of hope, drawing and pulling people in? It's not about reeling them in so that they can get involved with our ministry and our church, but it's just so they will know and feel the, the tangible love of God. This woman just, you know, had this classic, hey, I just met you, and this is crazy, but I love you. <laughs> it's like, you get me, and you just met me. How is that possible? I'm sure, you know, I'd love to get inside her head at the moment and go back in time and see just all that was racing, all that's not on the page. At any rate, God's love is so contagious, it really captures why we're here. And John Ford betrays this. To encourage the discouraged is a key part of all of our missions. To be salt and light, to be unity in community, and stir love as a root of faith. As the story concludes, the woman accepts Christ, his prophetic declaration, see verses 21 through 24, and fearlessly saves many Samaritans as a result. I'll let you read John 4, 39 through 43 for yourselves. Eventually, the Samaritans saw with their own eyes what the woman had said, so it's not like her testimony was written off. You know, she went in and was like, you know what, to heck what people think of me. I know people think I'm a slut. They think that, you know, I've had all these husbands 
they think I'm a whore, whatever. It doesn't matter because I am saved now. And it's important that these people know the truth of what I know, what I've been given, this gift, freely given. Now I'm going to freely give. It's inspiring. This story inspires from so many different angles. And I believe that this town, this, this community of Sakaar really grabbed onto it. It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard it for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. They bought into this, just like the woman did. The woman was kind of like the, was a one-person front line, the infiltrate that would save an entire town. Not bad for an ex-social leper who wasted years trying to find her identity and relationships and social status. She was free from that burden, and that was like an overflow. It's like the identity of who Jesus was and what he came to do. That was the, the heart of it. The oppression being gone, that was an overflow. So bottom line, scenic and de- uh, demographic details are valuable in studying the ministry of Christ. And the Bible, for that matter, is this chapter reminds us God can use the lowliest of men to sow the highest good for his glory and in bringing communities closer to it. As for being that catalyst of change in your arenas of influence, dare to see God like no one else so you can live intentionally like no one else. By believing God has established your steps, you can trust him to help you get to where you need to be, even if it means a few extra minutes or miles along the way. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed this. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below. You can shoot me a PM. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Um, As far as this pod, it's going up on SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to connect with us. You can even use the last page of our our website, the prayer prayer request tab to... uh, notify us, flag our attention. So we look forward to serving for you, writing for you, and praying for you in the weeks and months ahead. As I always say, you got this, and we'll catch you on the Friday.